As, as a chair, uh, she was one of the first uh, people to uh, notice or to have or to raise concerns about the general need for more exercise and better nutrition to improve life, to improve health, right? That is something that was there for decades and we are still talking about it. So here is a person who was here, talked about this so many, many years ago and we are still recognizing it. Unfortunately, upon her death in 1969, uh, she bequeathed her estate to uh, the Department of Biochemistry, which has been used to support the lectureship in this department for many, many years. And uh, as you, you, I will tell you, this lectureship features former associates of the department, uh, including former graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and faculty. So for now, today, it is a really great pleasure for me to introduce a former faculty member of this department who is going to deliver uh, this lecture, Professor Annette Menon. So Professor Menon got his PhD uh, from Cornell. And then he went on to do his uh, postdoctoral training with George Cross at Rockefeller uh, University in New York. And actually, that's where I heard about uh, Anat for the first time, because I was in a laboratory at Hopkins that was working on the, uh, the GPI-anchored uh, protein biosynthesis in the ER. And it was a very tough uh, competition at that time. But Anat handled it uh, uh, very well. So he was then, uh, he went on to uh, be a faculty member at Rockefeller. And then in 1993, he joined the Department of Biochemistry as assistant professor. So he went through all the ranks. And then until uh, uh, 2005, and he continued during that time he was here to work on the GPI anchor, uh, anchor the proteins biosynthesis. GPI, by the way, is glucosyl phosphatidoinositol uh, uh, anchor, you know, proteins very important and he made major contributions in that area. When he got here, he, made, uh, he started new projects uh, to, to look at the transfer of phospholipids in the membranes and between the membranes. Uh, he, will talk up, he may talk about the uh, phospholipid scramblazes and uh, intracellular transport of uh, uh, steroids. Now for reasons that I'm not gonna uh, tell you, uh, Anat decided in 2005 to return to New York. And so he has been at New York as a professor of biochemistry at the Cornell Medical School uh, for that long, until, until, until up, up to now, as a matter of fact. But then we thought he would be the appropriate person to come and uh, deliver this uh, lecture in, in biochemistry. So I don't want to take too much of your time. You are really welcome back to Madison, and we really missed you. So thank you very much, James. I'm a little confused to be back, actually a little dazed to be back, because I uh, sort of walk around a few streets, a few alleyways, and everything is different. There, there used to be passages going from A to B, but there's now a glass steel box that interrupts that passage, and there are many of these that have been built, and it's not been that long, it seems to me, but it's um, obviously lots of progress, at least, uh, in terms of putting these impediments into, into small passageways, that one. But uh, so much more lab space. But it's also good to see so many, uh, so many friends. So I've um, uh, lots of people here that I obviously know for, and have known for years and haven't seen for years. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to be here. Um, I, th I thought I would um, add one slide to James's introduction about Gladys Everson. I was looking, uh, trying to find out uh, to see what I could find out about her. And I discovered this obituary that was published 10 years uh, after her death in the Journal of Nutrition. And it says something quite interesting, which appeals to my sense of, uh, sense of humor. And I think the students who had lunch with me were probably disturbed at that sense of humor because they probably got a little more loose talk than they were used to at that, that kind of format. So here is a person who, in quest of information, uh, would occasionally relieve the library of a long-awaited new book without the formality of signing it out. 
And when she would elude the campus police in her rush to the laboratory to rescue samples left in the drying oven, she was merely achieving her goal of advancing science. And the comment here is that the books were always returned and the campus police always had another chance. So this is someone <laughs> one month well, really would like to have as a colleague. And then she did, uh, there's this other little bit of description here which appeals to the iPhone age, I suppose. She's fond of describing uh, unproductive activity as a poor use of one's time. <laughs> And then, um, and then this business of leaving notes endlessly. Apparently, she left notes for a whole range of people, her night owl working habits, which caused great concern to the janitorial and security staff, and nocturnal communiques left for the students and faculty, apparently more and more illegible as she grew older, but, uh, but still kept on leaving these notes, disturbing the daylights out of everyone, I think. So this is someone, uh, this is a colleague that the department should, uh, and one should aspire to, perhaps. <laughs> okay. So I want to start with, uh, with, a, with a very broad, uh, broad description of the, of the problem that I'm going to talk about. Some of it will be on elementary terms, just to make sure that everyone knows uh, what it is I'm saying. I work here. There's a spread of institutions here going from Rockefeller University to Sloan Kettering Cancer Center to, the, uh, to Cornell University Medical College. So I was uh, in buildings over here. I'm now in buildings over here. And in between, I was, uh, was in Madison. Okay, so just to, uh, just to start with, uh, with cells, this is a book that I particularly like, and if students have any, any sense of any appeal for quantitative things, for length scales, time scales, just to be able to do back of the envelope calculations, there are a phenomenal num amount of information in this, in this book, Cell Biology by the Numbers. So they are very precise on, the, on, a useful, on a useful scale. So here is a mammalian cell grown stuck on plastic, so it's spread out. Uh, 50 microns or so in diameter, in dimension, a yeast cell with five, uh, five microns across. What you see in both these cartoons is that the cells are extremely compartmentalized. This is something that we all know. Uh, very many compartments. You have the green of the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, various ways in which the cells are, have boxes within them that do particular functions. So I focus on yeast because a lot of my lab works in the, in the yeast system, although we do other things as well. So here is the yeast cell now blown up, and you see here the cell wall in yellow and the endoplasmic reticulum in, uh, in, in green. But in reality, the, uh, there's not just compartmentation, but there's a whole lot of architecture that is important in the cell. So if you look at this model of a yeast cell that, uh, that was done in my lab using this focus ion beam scanning electron micrograph, you see a lot of the cell has not been depicted here, but what's important is that the plasma membrane is coated with endoplasmic reticulum on about 50% of its surface. And this is an ER network that is attached to the plasma membrane through tethering molecules. So there are protein molecules anchored to the ER that reach out and contact uh, anionic lipids on the plasma membrane, stitching the ER along the length of the plasma membrane. And you can imagine what this might, uh, what impact this might have on various communications. This is the sort of thing that is important in uh, store-operated calcium entry where you have the STIM-1 ER sensor that talks to a calcium channel in the plasma membrane and it's also been implicated in, in lipid traffic. So we'll see something about that in a few moments. But the endoplasmic reticulum for all practical purposes is where lipids are made. So it's a, it's a biogenic membrane, it's able to make its own components, integrate those components into its own fabric and also transport those components to other, to other parts of the cell. That's an oversimplification. Lipids are made elsewhere as well, but the bulk of anything one talks about in terms of lipid synthesis occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum. And because of that, you need some transport. So you need to take uh, what you make in the ER to the plasma membrane, for example, the bounding membrane of the cell that has a particular lipid composition, thickness, fluidity, and so on, that defines its barrier properties, as opposed to the ER, which is biogenic and, and a little more uh, promiscuous in terms of what it will allow to, uh, to, uh, for permeation. And also here you can, uh, you can imagine an organelle such as the mitochondrion where you have to take uh, lipids that are made in the ER to populate mitochondrial uh, membranes. So one example, and I will highlight this briefly, is the problem of how sterols move around inside cells. So sterols are made in the endoplasmic reticulum. The bulk of the biosynthetic apparatus, famously HMG-CoA reductase, the enzyme that is targeted by statins, is located in the ER, and the 20-odd steps of cholesterol biosynthesis occur in the ER membrane. A uh, similar state of affairs in yeast, that where agosterol is the predominant sterol instead of cholesterol. 
Um, but even though the even though sterols are made here, they're only about five percent, five mole percent of all lipids. So one in twenty lipid molecules in the ER membrane is a is a sterol molecule. Whereas in the plasma membrane, sterols are highly concentrated. So one out of every two or three molecules of lipid is a is a sterol in the plasma membrane. So you need to traffic uh, the biosynthetic. Uh, the bolus of sterol here to the plasma membrane and other compartments in the cell. You also need to traffic sterols to mitochondria where steroid hormones are made. And um, this is an image of what a yeast cell looks like. You can take, uh, take a molecule called dehydroagosterol, which is only one double bond different from agosterol. It's a conjugated double bond system, makes the molecule fluorescent. It's a nasty fluorescence, but you can, uh, it's UV excited, but still you can, uh, you can image these and use it, uh, use it to study uh, various properties at the level of uh, fluorescence microscopy. Okay, so what do we know about how this transport occurs? So one is transport to organelles is going to occur by some pathway that doesn't involve secretory vesicles. There are no vesicles that are known that take anything from the endoplasmic reticulum to, uh, to mitochondria, so some non-vesicular pathway. But that's also true of transport of molecules to the, uh, to the plasma membrane. You can shut off uh, vesicle-mediated budding, fusion, etc. All of those pathways can be shut off pharmacologically in a mammalian cell or used through the use of a sec mutant, for example, in yeast, and uh, sterol transport occurs just fine. So in general, and sterol is the example I've used here, but in general, lipids can go around by non-vesicular means, which doesn't mean that vesicles don't carry lipids. Vesicles, of course, made of membranes. They're trafficking lipids, of course, but, but in general, there is a bulk pathway more than, uh, with more than enough capacity to take, to take lipids around. Uh, from, their site, from their site of synthesis to the plasma membrane and to organelles. And the usual way to think of that is that you have a molecule that looks like albumin, sort of. Some, some protein in the cytoplasm with a hydrophobic binding pocket, a little more sophisticated in this case because the binding pocket is, uh, sort of is, a, is literally a pocket, but then there's a, there's a flap that would close it off. So some molecule like this flying around in the cytoplasm in a collisional encounter, picking up uh, lipid from one membrane and in a second encounter, dropping it off somewhere else. So that's how you can imagine how that works. These are molecules that usually allow for bidirectional transport because they are simply catalysts. They're like cyclodextrins in the cytoplasm, just bouncing around between membranes and allowing for a homeostatic regulation of lipid composition in their different compartments. And sometimes they act at these contact sites where the ER is in close proximity uh, to the plasma membrane, as I showed you in the model on, in an earlier slide. So we know lots about these things, about these types of molecules. There are very many of them that have been identified. They were identified years ago through assays, in vitro assays, uh, where lipid molecules were seen to go from microsomes to mitochondria. And this is the work of Don Zilversmith at Cornell in the 1970s. And many molecules now have been identified that would play such roles in the test tube. There's no shortage of them. Tom Martin has some of these uh, here that are involved in phosphoinositide metabolism. So they all work in moving lipids around between vesicles in the test tube. What they do in cells is less, is less clear, but because they're molecules in hand, you can figure out many things. You can crystallize them, you can do molecular dynamic simulations, you can study how they, what their requirements are for transfer. So you can get an idea of how the machinery works, but, but their physiological importance is not entirely clear. So this is a crystal structure of one of the sterol carriers. You can see the, cholest uh, the cholesterol molecule here with its hydroxyl end buried here. And then this little flap over here is this, the omega loop, which will close once the molecule disengages. So that's a structure we did along with several others uh, not so long ago. Okay, so that's the, that, that sets the system for making things in the ER and shipping, shipping molecules from the ER. But what about the ER uh, membrane itself? And this is the, uh, basically the subject of my, of my talk today. So the, the problem is set up as follows. All phospholipids are made on the cytoplasmic side of the ER membrane. This, this pale blue-green slab is the, is the membrane bilayer. So if you want to make a phosphatidylcholine molecule and use the Kennedy pathway to make it, you, the, this is the reaction. You start with diacylglycerol and take CDP choline, which is a cytoplasmically generated molecule, doesn't cross the ER membrane. Phosphocholine is transferred and you make your phospholipid here and release CMP. So that reaction occurs on the cytoplasmic face of the ER. And that's true for every major phospholipid, phosphatidylinositol, ethnolamine, serine, so on. All these lipids are made on the cytoplasmic side. And really the problem is how do you get across? Because some of what you make has to be transferred to the other side to grow the bilayer uniformly. Otherwise, because of the bilayer couple hypothesis, which is more than a hypothesis at this stage, you start getting membrane 
uh, curvature because one, one leaflet is expanding at the expense of the other leaflet. You need that kind of expansion in particular cases. For example, you want to sculpt a vesicle, you might need something like that. But in general, you want to have the ER grow uniformly except for places of uh, where it's curved, tightly curved, uh, where you have tubule uh, formation and so on. So you need some, some method to transfer the lipid across the membrane. And here I've already given you an indication that that method uh, involves a protein. So not only do you need uh, lipid movement across membranes for, for just membrane growth, you need it also for a couple of other, inter there are many, many places in cells where you need this, but I highlight a couple of them. One is this problem of lipid asymmetry at the plasma membrane. I'll show you that in a, in a slide in a, mo in a moment. The plasma membrane is very strongly asymmetric, and you need under particular physiological prompts to dissipate that asymmetry. And the other is for glycoprotein synthesis, which is a preoccupation of mine. James mentioned my interest in GPI anchor biosynthesis, but the same problem applies to N-glycosylation and other forms of glycosylation in the endoplasmic reticulum. So the example of the plasma membrane, I've simplified the plasma membrane to one phospholipid, which is phosphatidylserine, which is localized to the cytoplasmic face of the plasma membrane exclusively. There's no PS displayed on the outside. And yet, when needed, you need to display that PS. And, and that happens under particular conditions. Blood coagulation will not happen without the display of PS on the surface of activated platelets. So if there is a defect in the process that uh, exposes PS on blood platelets, you have a bleeding disorder called Scott syndrome. And there are several other versions of that. PS is displayed in apoptotic cells. Uh, and this is as part of the program for, for cell death. And, and it then becomes a marker for, for picking up those cells. Macrophages use that as one of the recognition markers for, uh, for phagocytic clearance of the cells. And similarly, you need every morning when you wake up, and if you haven't been looking at your iPhone all night and disturbed your entire circadian rhythm, uh, PS is exposed on the tips of your photoreceptor cells in the eye, so the rod outer segments, which are bland in terms of their PS exposure, they look exactly like a plasma membrane with no PS on the outside, suddenly turn on PS in their top 10%. And PS becomes exposed to the outside, recognized by the retinal pigment epithelium, and the top 10% is eaten, and new discs photoreceptor discs come up from the bottom. So every morning, this ferocious phagocyte in the retina takes off the top 10% in response to a PS signal. And that, again, requires exposure of PS specifically as a signal on the outside. OK, so you need uh, lipid flipping to occur in some sort of physiological time frame for these things to, to happen. And then this impossible problem here, which I have to highlight. I, you know, I tend not to talk about this, but I really have to talk about it because it's a preoccupation for years. I lose sleep over this. So this is, a, this is a textbook picture, and this is a part that many will be familiar with, which is you have a membrane-bound ribosome translating message. A protein comes through the translocon. Um, and if that protein exposes a glycosylation sequon, which is a triplet of amino acids starting with an asparagine residue that will eventually get modified by the oligosaccharide, followed by any amino acid and an hydroxy amino acid, that little triplet of amino acids is recognized by a multi-subunit enzyme called oligosaccharyl transferase. And, uh, and, and this collection, this oligosaccharide, is slapped onto the asparagine residue. That oligosaccharide comes from a lipid. So you first build it, all 14 sugars on diphosphate isoprenoid lipid. And that little snake here is 100 carbons long in mammalian cells, made of 20 repeating 5-carbon units. So this part is OK, except that the synthesis of this lipid starts on the other side of the membrane uh, with, uh, with dolichol that is phosphorylated to make dolichyl phosphate. And in the first reaction, uh, sugar phosphate is added to make the diphosphate linkage. And that's the tunicomycin sensitive reaction for those of you who use tunicomycin for, let's say, experiments with the unfolded protein response. This is what upsets the pathway, preventing proteins from being glycosylated. Then a second sugar is added. These are both N-acetyl glucosamines followed by five mannose residues in green. And then this whole thing is flipped over the, over the membrane to be continued with four more mannose residues and three blue glucose residues. So this flipping has to happen in real time. A yeast cell that cannot do N-glycosylation will not grow. So this whole pathway is essential in yeast. And so it has to happen on the time scale of a yeast cell doubling. OK, so those are the three examples. The ER growth of an ER membrane, uh, the exposure of PS on the outside of, of cells, and N-glycosylation. So just a little bit of history. So spontaneous flipping, um, I've already alluded to this. This doesn't happen in real time. Uh, if you take a synthetic membrane and put a labeled polar lipid on one side, it'll, it'll flip over once a day, roughly. So this is, not, this is not physiologically relevant. It is a background level of 
flipping that uh, for which compensation needs to occur. So you don't want PS exposed even at that slow rate, but it's not relevant for any of the processes uh, that I've described. And the first time anyone knew about that was in 1971 in this paper by Kornberg and McConnell. This is Roger Kornberg of transcription factor fame, but this is his PhD work when he had more sense, I suppose, and worked on lipids instead. And um, the other thing to know is that flipping occurs really, really quickly in, uh, in biological membranes. So if you take a bacillus membrane, bacillus megatherium was used uh, in this particular example, uh, then you get flipping that is commensurate with cell growth. You have, uh, you have lipids exchanging between leaflets of the bilayer in under a minute. And that was the first time anyone measured anything like that was this paper here by Rothman and Kennedy. This is Gene Kennedy who discovered most of the phospholipid biosynthetic pathways. And that's Jim Rothman who's gone on again to do other things, should have stayed with lipids as well. <laughs> okay. So these transporters that are, that are needed to promote fast flipping come in two flavors. One is, one is the, the ATP-dependent flavor. So there are proteins that use ATP hydrolysis and couple that hydrolysis to the movement of lipids. And because they do that, they're necessarily slow. They are no better than about 100 lipids per protein per second because that's the rate at which ATP is hydrolyzed. And those proteins are called flipases if they move a lipid from the outside to the inside exo to endo, or they are flopases if they do the other thing. But these are both ATP-driven transporters that move lipids against their concentration gradient. So they are uphill transporters. There's the other variety, which are called scramblases. And these are the ones needed for end glycosylation and for growing the endoplasmic reticulum bilayer. And these come, again, in two flavors. But they, are, they don't require metabolic energy. Their flavors are because they're regulated. So there are those in the plasma membrane that are turned on by calcium, uh, micromolar calcium. And then there are those in the endoplasmic reticulum that are constitutively on. So the glycosylation scramblases are constitutively on. The ones that allow the ER to reset its phospholipid imbalance in response to synthesis, is that, that, that transport is constitutively on as well. And these are super fast. If you take them out of the membrane, or at least take the activity out of the membrane by detergent solubilization and reconstitution, they transfer lipids faster than 100,000 per second. So this is. That's because that's the best number one can get if it, it's quite possibly 10 to the 6 per second, which becomes the rate at which an ion channel would transport an ion. So, the, so that's one, uh, frame, one, one thing to think about. So I'm going to show you uh, uh, the, the sort of setting in which I'm going to talk about this, about this problem of lipid scrambling. And it begins with a picture drawn here by this gentleman in the front row, Adam Steinberg, who does these it's the same picture that's on the, on the poster. And it's one way to think about how a lipid might, uh, might move across a membrane. So it's, uh, it's basically short-circuiting the bilayer. So you want to connect the two leaflets of the bilayer. You can view the lipid as a giant ion, except it has the problem of having a pair of legs attached to it. So what do you do with the legs? You can roll everything up into a ball and, and push it through some sort of cavity, one of these lipid transport protein type cavities, and then drop it off on the other side. It's, it, it's possible to do something like that. Or, or have something like this, which is a concept that we've developed here, actually. I think I was talking about this idea with, with Adam, and Ivan Raymond walked up and said, oh, it looks like a credit card. And that, then Adam drew a cartoon that looked like a credit card being swiped uh, through a card reader, which is more or less what this uh, picture tells you. So you've got lipids here that are walking through a protein uh, cavity. And that protein cavity is hydrophilic. And there's an energy penalty to pay to expose that hydrophilicity to the membrane. And so one way to compensate is to have an amphipathic adapter. And so the lipid would be the adapter. So its head, which is vitrionic or, or charged in some way, talks to the hydrophilic part. And the legs talk to the membrane. And you can imagine a path like this, where the two leaflets are short-circuited. So this is what would happen if you have a protein. The barrier that has been reduced in, so in doing something like this is about 80 kilojoules per mole or 20 kcals per mole for those of you who think in kcals. So this is not going to happen on a spontaneous, at an appreciable spontaneous rate. And uh, it's downhill movement, basically. It's allowing the short circuit allows basically diffusion to go in whichever direction uh, that you need in order to dissipate a concentration gradient. OK. So I began this working on this because of a conference I attended. I was attracted to this idea. I heard about the glycosylation pathways first, and then the general problem of lipid scrambling at the ER. And then uh, started that in New York, and then came to uh, Madison, where a number of uh, people in the lab started. So the project began with Tor Regberg, who helped, uh, who helped uh, make particular lipid substrates that we were interested in, very short-chain uh, short lipids. This was, he's an organic chemist from the University of Stockholm. 
the process of making this lipid was uh, was enormously difficult for me and totally trivial for him. So that's how uh, the lipid got made initially. And then the project was picked up by a couple of graduate students, the first of whom was Sigrun uh, here, who joined the lab, I think, in 93 or 4 ish as a rotation student, along with this person here who worked on a different project but is now sitting in the front row in an orange shirt if anyone wants to spot him. And, um, and I moved to New York with Yolanta here, who is also in the front row and, is, and, and works in Madison. So these were the people in the lab when I started, and Bill Watkins came a, a year or two later. We also had a couple of German visitors from Humboldt University because I had a grant with a with Andreas Hermann at the Humboldt, and so they would come for a few weeks at a time and then leave, uh, all very productive for, the, for developing assays by which one could measure this uh, transport process. It's a non-trivial assay to set up, and these were the people who set it up, also set up the reconstitution of the activity as well, which is solubilize everything in detergent and put it back together in a vesicle, therefore allowing anything to move forward, any identification to happen. So that's all ancient history, a very long time ago, really very long time ago deep in the last century. <laughs> okay, so the problem is that most scramblazes are not known. So when these projects were started, there were no scramblazes that had been identified. There was not a single name. There were proposed activities, and the activities had been proposed in the 70s from the work that I talked to you about. And of course, if you don't know the scramblazes, you don't know how they work, and so you can imagine all kinds of things, like this credit card model that I've alluded to. So, you, you know, so unconstrained by fact, with just a few principles, you can make up nice drawings and stories uh, like that. So that's the, that's the problem. So the situation has changed a little bit. The endoplasmic reticulum that I'm interested in still is an unsolved membrane as far as the scramblazes are concerned. None of the glycosylation scramblazes have been identified, and I can tell you what we're doing about that. Uh, but basically, everything in the ER remains to be identified, which is quite shocking considering that genomes have been sequenced. Uh, one knows the names of everything in the ER, more or less, not everything. Surprisingly, there are still proteins with, uh, you know, in yeast open reading frames that uh, without assigned function. But, uh, but I have a suspicion that uh, many of these proteins will end up being dual function proteins. They're known for one thing and are doing this on the side, or doing this on the real, as their real job in doing the other thing on the side, whatever it is, but, but it's not, uh, it's, uh, there are ways around this, and I can talk about that in a moment. Um, Two of the plasma membrane scramblazes have been identified through heroic sort of fact screening efforts by the Nagata lab in Kyoto. One is the TMEM16 family. This is a family of calcium activated ion channels, many of which are also lipid scramblazes. So they are able to pass ions and transport lipids at the same time. And uh, this is the class of protein that is involved in Scott syndrome, the bleeding disorder. So TMEM16F, there are 10 of them in mammalian cells. If 16F is messed up, then blood platelets don't expose PS and you have bleeding disorder. And then you have the XK-related family, XKR8 was the first of those. And these are the scramblazes that are turned on by caspases. So they have a caspase-mediated cleavage that activates them, and this is what exposes PS in apoptotic cells. So those regulated ones have been identified. And then, quite surprisingly, we have one unregulated, constitutively active scramblaze, which is, uh, which is rhodopsin. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it, uh, it, it's the prototype for other class A G-protein couple receptors, so the other GPCRs that we've looked at have also got scramblaze activity. If you purify one of these proteins, stick them in a vesicle, you get scrambling rates that are equivalent uh, to what you would get with any of these proteins as well, so upwards of 10 to the 5 per second. And so this comes, of course, from photoreceptor discs, and this is what I mentioned. The top 10% get eaten every morning by these neighboring pigment epithelial cells. There are about 40 of these rods that dock into one pigment epithelium, which uses the top 10% of the rods for breakfast, basically. So, Okay, so I got interested in this because, of course, I was interested in the endoplasmic reticulum and not getting anywhere uh, uh, fast. When I got invited to write a grant proposal, I got a phone call from someone whose accent I couldn't follow, and but it turned out that what he wanted was a proposal to do something about macular degeneration. And they were shopping around asking people who had nothing to do with the eye uh, to write proposals to try and bring people in from the outside who might weigh in on this problem. I'd never heard of macular degeneration. I didn't know anything about the eye. It turns out, of course, that the eye is, has a huge amount of lipid traffic going on. You don't recycle uh, retinal unless you traffic the retinal outside the rod discs out of the rod cell into the neighboring cell, all kinds of traffic has to happen in real time. But, uh, but as a result of this grant which I got, I got it here actually, um, 
I discovered these papers, and these are papers from 93 and 2000, which basically say that the photoreceptor discs in the eye, in the rod outer segments, uh, have an endoplasmic-like reticulum-like phospholipid scrambling activity, which is if you put in a spin-labeled phospholipid into one side, it will equi it equilibrate super fast with the other side. And this was uh, the work done by Wayne, uh, Wayne Hubble originally, and then uh, repeated by uh, Klaus Peter Hoffman's group. So the photoreceptor discs have uh, scramblase activity. And I thought, well, these discs have really only rhodopsin. Hubble thought that it might not be rhodopsin. They have hardly any other proteins. It's a very small proteome, although every time you look around, there are a few more proteins stacked onto it, but certainly much less than the endoplasmic reticulum. So this would be a good place to start. You take, uh, you find cow eyes, there are plenty of them. You prepare the retina, you get the discs, you do what we know how to do with the ER, uh, remove rhodopsin and see what's left and, and so on and progress that way. So the end result of all of that uh, was that it was rhodopsin. So we took it away and lost the activity. We purified it. It came right back. We forgot about the cow eyes and the retina and made the rhodopsin in a Cho cell, a Cos cell, a Hex cell. It doesn't matter where you make it, some heterologous system. So there was no mysterious disc component that was coming with it, a purified protein made somewhere else. And that was also true of the adrenergic receptor and the adenosine A2A receptor, other class A GPCRs. These were all scrambling lipids uh, when, uh, when brought, into the, uh, brought into the context of a liposome. And so I sat on that result for quite a long time because it's a famous protein and one doesn't want to throw mud at it, you know, in, in terms of uh, uh, assigning a new activity, but it's, uh, it's what it is. And um, so we published that quite a bit after the, after the initial discovery. And then it, this was followed up very quickly by trying to see if the process had anything to do with the light sensing function, the signaling function of the protein. And so you can make flavors of the protein that first of all don't have retinal. These are views of the seven helical bundle from the cytoplasmic side. So there are two opsins which don't have retinal and two rhodopsins that have either the 11 cis retinal here or the all trans. And particular mutations and, and you can play with the protein different ways to get representatives of each of these pools. And all of these as far as we could tell were scrambling lipids. So this is the work of Mike Gorin who was a PhD student in this department with Brian Fox and uh, also did some of his work with uh, Jay Bangs in microbiology and then came to me as a, as a postdoc. So he's now at Regeneron having done this, having set up this whole system to study, uh, to study lipid scrambling. Okay, so it is uh, opsin, rhodopsin. So I'm going to say opsin because rhodopsin, we don't care about the retinal anymore and it's a headache to work in the dark room with this protein and you can do just as well with the, uh, with the retinal free a version of it. So there are several immediate questions that uh, come into play, but, but first let me tell you just quickly that we, you phone up people who do crystallography, and this, is, this was before crystallography of, these, of GPCRs was quite so prominent as it is now. So you phone up people who have done the crystallography, who have samples of uh, crystallography grade proteins, they send you the proteins, you reconstitute them, and you get activities, so some are in the presence of antagonists, some inverse agonists, and so on. So all of these, these and several other class A rhodopsin family GPCRs that we've assayed, all with scrambled lipids this fast. So what does that all mean? I mean, no one, I mean, this is a weird thing for G protein coupled receptors to do. They're sitting in the plasma membrane. You don't want PS exposed on the plasma membrane, as I've told you, because there are perfectly good reasons that you don't want a macrophage uh, to come and uh, you know, swallow up the cell. So what's the physiological relevance? How is it regulated, if at all? And then how does it work? So those, those are uh, questions to consider. So here, is, uh, here we are back to the photoreceptor cell. This is a nice electron micrograph from a colleague showing you the disks uh, lined up here. And I'm going to highlight one of the disks in, in the next slide. And what is surprising is that all the three classes of transporter that I showed you, talked to you about earlier on, which is the flipases, flopases, and scramblases, all of, the, all of these three classes, which are typically present in different membranes in, say, an epithelial cell, are all found within the disc membrane. So you have rhodopsin or opsin that is scrambling lipids, so moving lipids bidirectionally. You have a P-type ATPase, which is a flipase that moves lipids from the disc lumen to the cytoplasmic side. And you have an ABC transporter, which is doing an unlikely thing, because most ABC transporters uh, transport the other way, but this one is acting as a flipase as well. And the interesting thing is that this one is specific for, ana for amino phospholipids, favoring PS. And this one, 
moves a retinal phosphatidylethanolamine adduct, and this is a connection with macular degeneration. So I'll, I can explain that afterwards uh, uh, at the end of the talk if someone has a question, but this is a, an interesting lipid that if, it, if it's not transported, gives rise to a fluorescent lipofusin aggregate in the eye, which is the starting point of, uh, of the, of the age-related macular degeneration. So the end result of having these things go on is that lipids are being moved from the luminal face of the disc to the cytoplasmic side. So minus one inside, plus one outside, you keep having these ATP driven things doing their 100 lipids a second, moving a lipid from the inside to the outside. And that can't go on for uh, forever. A disc lasts 10 days and this can't, uh, this can't keep going on. So what this protein is doing, and that's a speculation, is that it's resetting the lipid number on the two sides of the of the bilayer, so you keep allowing the lipids to sample both sides of the bilayer while moving particular lipids uh, to the cytoplasmic side. So this allows uh, the bilayer to stay normal, so the imbalance is corrected by this, which basically acts as a, a release valve for all the pumping done by the other proteins. It sounds like a short circuit, but the, these are particular lipids uh, that need to be moved out, whereas this one just resets the total number. It doesn't care which lipid, so long as the packing is arranged. So that's a possible function for rhodopsin, but not yet for the other GPCRs, which we can come to uh, later. The other is regulation. So I alluded to this already, which is every mammalian cell has GPCRs on the surface, and they are not all exposing PS, except on demand, except when triggered. So here is a, here is a cost cell expressing opsin. You can see the protein labeled from the outside with red and the nucleus in blue. And it's been uh, treated with calcium and an ionophore, or it doesn't matter if you don't treat it, and then you stain. Uh, with a fluorescently labeled anexin, which, uh, which binds to phosphatidylserine molecules, and there's no labeling at all. Whereas if you take TMEM16F, this is the Scott syndrome, the bleeding disorder, calcium-activated ion channel that's also doing scrambling, and you express that in cells. Uh, nothing happens unless you add calcium and the ionophore, but when you do, then you get uh, fluorescent staining on the outside. So this one works at the plasma membrane, exposing PS on calcium trigger, but this one doesn't do anything at all. And that's not a surprise because hex cells, any other cells that you want, have plenty of different types of GPCRs. None of them are exposing PS on the outside. So the, all, this whole family of GPCRs is silenced at the plasma membrane, and that may have something uh, to do with the composition of the plasma membrane, its thickness, its saturated lipids, its cholesterol content, all of these things. So that's, that's one way for the membrane, perhaps, to regulate, uh, to regulate the activity. Okay. So mechanism, so that's, uh, that's what I want to spend the rest of the talk on. So how do we measure these things? I've made uh, several comments about setting up assays which were done here actually by Bill Watkins, this, this particular assay. And one, the easiest assay, we've done several different ones, is to use a fluorescently labeled lipid. You can buy these, we used to make them at one point. And this is a, this is a phospholipid with a, normal phospholipid with a normal head group, a phosphodiester, a glycerol entity, and then here, on a short carbon chain, you have a fluorophore, and this fluorophore is nitrobenzdioxazole. The nitro is relevant because when you reduce it, when you chemically reduce it with dithionite, which is uh, this molecule over here, the nitro becomes amino and the fluorescence is killed. It's irreversible, it's gone. So what we do is we reconstitute large unilamellar vesicles like this. Uh, we can have proteins in them or not. The fluorescent lipid is included at the time of reconstitution, so it's on both sides of the membrane. And then you treat with dithionite, which is this reagent here. And it doesn't cross the membrane, one does controls for that, and it can be expected because it's got two minus charges, it's not going to cross easily. And when you treat with dithionite, all the fluorescent lipid on the outside is killed, so the nitros become aminos, there's no fluorescent left, and the inside is protected because it doesn't go out in an empty vesicle or in a vesicle with any relevant protein in it. But if you have opsin here or another scramblase here, then the lipids can exchange and all will become exposed to dithionite at some point. So the assay goes from 50% in a dead system, where you only modify the outside, to 100% uh, when you're able to exchange both leaflets. And the reconstitutions are done like this. I'm explaining this because it's important for what I say later. We purify the protein. It's in dodecyl maltoside or other detergent. It's in a micelle, so it's got a nice belt of detergent around it. We start with pre-made vesicles that we, to which we add a little bit of detergent to make them permissive, so they are now able to take in protein. And then when you combine the two, you start removing the direct maltoside with, uh, with biobeads. It's a polystyrene adsorbent that just takes away uh, detergent specifically. And then the proteins jump in. Some vesicles stay empty. Some have one. Some have two proteins and so on. And uh, the vesicles look very nice. They have a nice size range. Uh, that's a cryo, 
uh, EM image done at the New York Structural Biology Center. And then you get assays like this. So you add dithionite at this point. And if you have no proteins in the vesicles, you get a res result like this, 45-ish percent. That's what passes for 50 in biology. And then if you reconstitute increasing amounts of protein, uh, you get increasing extents of reduction. And we top out here. We never do better than this. And that's because as the reconstitution system is such, and not just for scramblazes, for any transporter, there seem to be a population of vesicles that simply will not uh, will not take protein. They just uh, they refuse to take protein, possibly because their detergent has been wicked away by the beads before the protein had a chance to get in, whatever. But there's a fraction of those that don't take protein. So the assay goes from about 45 to about 80, 85 percent instead of 50 to 100. The other thing to notice here is that the kinetics are all the same. So even though these graphs look nice and you see nice curves and so on, the rate of reduction that you see for liposomes is the same as you see for a proteoliposome which is we're not getting any kinetic information here. These traces are governed by the rate at which dithionite uh, bleaches the uh, NBD fluorophore. So all we measure are endpoints, which is as you increase the amount of reconstituted protein, you get increasing endpoints. And, but you can still use these kinetics to make an estimate. You know how many, what the size of the vesicles is, how many lipids there are per vesicle, and that's where this number of more than 10 to the 5 lipids per second comes from. So one point I made earlier, and I'm going to repeat here, is that this, this is not seen when you reconstitute any old protein. You can take TMEM-16 proteins that have, uh, amongst family members, for example, some will do it, some will not. If you leave out the calcium, they don't do it, and so on. You can dial up people, and they'll send you proteins, and they won't do it. So this is a particular reconstitution of a particular protein that confers scrambling activity. So because of the endpoint assay, you can do something interesting. You can play with the amount of protein you reconstitute. So here's the protein to phospholipid ratio. And because it's a yes, no thing, a vesicle that has a protein has the activity, one that doesn't, doesn't have it, you can ask what is the probability that a vesicle has at least one scramblaze. And as you titrate in the amount of protein, you, you increase the probability like this. When you have no protein, of course, no scramblaze. Uh, lots of protein, you have lots of scramblaze. And it goes up very nicely according to Poisson statistics. You can use that. Uh, to deduce uh, the size of the functional entity that was reconstituted, because this is done in curious units. It's the grams of protein per mole of phospholipid. So you know what the, from the fit constant, what the mass is of the protein that was inserted. And it turns out in the case of our opsin molecule to be 90 plus 100 kilodaltons, which is a bit which is a bit upsetting because an opsin monomer is 41 kilodalton. So, so the only way to deal with this result is to assume that the opsin is going as a dimer or a multimer. And the way we think of that is the following, which is you start with a monomer, you have your permissive vesicles, and as you remove detergent, the first thing that happens is something like this, where the protein spares detergent by making a hydrophobic interface like that before jumping into the vesicle. So you multimerize before insertion. And uh, just to just to emphasize one point, the insertion, it's a single insertion that confers activity. It's not cooperative. You don't need one insertion followed by a second partner. And you know that because these graphs are all going straight up. There's no, there's no sigmoid here, so you never see that. So a single insertion of a dimer or a multimer confers the activity uh, to a vesicle. And we know that we start with monomers. There's nothing funny going on there because you can do experiments like this, which is you can prepare a snap-tagged opsin. You can immobilize it on a glass slide. You label the snap tab, of course, with a fluorophore. Image all these fluorescent dots on your slide, and then up the laser intensity so you can watch them bleach. And they all bleach in a single step. If these were multimers or dimers, they would bleach in, uh, in two discrete steps often enough. So they bleach in a single step. They're all monomers when they start. And um, sorry. So they're monomers when they start, but they enter the vesicles as dimers or multimers because of this graph. OK, so how does this thing work? So we have two options. One is a opsin protomer would scramble lipids by some magical means, some uh, short circuiting of the bilayer like this. Or it could be that the, the interface between these protomers is somehow privileged, and that's where the, that's where the action is. And uh, we got around that by looking at some disease mutations. There are, there's a disease called retinitis pigmentosa, where the rod cells are basically destroyed over time. And there are several mutations. Lots of patients come through. Mutations are, are mapped. So one knows about several mutations in this disease. Many are assigned to rhodopsin. And it's clear why they are disease mutations, because the protein's not made, or it's not trafficked properly, or doesn't bind retinol, all kinds of things. 
But there were several of them that, are enigma that were enigmatic. There was no obvious reason, perfectly nice protein. And we got interested in several sites that face the membrane. So this is this uh, F45 on helix 1 pointed towards the bilayer and a couple here on helix 5 uh, that also point to the bilayer. And we thought, why then? This might be a scrambling issue because they're facing the membrane and could be active uh, that way. And it turned out not to be the case. All of these mutations that we tested, I'll show you what they are on the next slide. All of them scramble lipids, but they did something interesting. So they are F220CV209 M F2 F45L. All of them did something interesting, and it was obvious to the postdoc who was doing these experiments that there was something interesting here because she could use less protein to get a maximal signal than she needed to use with wild type, even without making this graph she knew that there was something up because less protein gave her the same activity. And the graph tells you exactly why. Because you populate, you get up to a maximum probability by, by at, a, at a smaller point on this titration scale. And if you do the fits, uh, you end up with this. Whereas the wild type comes in at a close to 100, all of these mutations have the molecular mass of a monomer. So just individual mutations uh, are allowing this to happen. They prevent the pre-dimerization and they go in straight uh, as a monomer. So we know that a monomer of opsin uh, will scramble lipids. And that's what's depicted here. So you have a large unilamella vesicle with uh, 200,000 or so phospholipids. You have a single opsin molecule, and the leaflets here are being exchanged at faster than 100,000 per second. So that's the setup. We also had another quadruple mutation, which was nastier to make and less physiologically important, but this also went in as a monomer. So we know this uh, for multi from multiple angles that an opsin monomer will do this. OK, so the opsin and these other GPCRs are famous proteins. And there are so many structures available. There's so much biophysics. And there's not a hint. It just looked like a little Teflon blob. There's nothing in the protein that suggested how it might work. So you know, we were sitting around uh, wondering whether we'd have to mutagenize the daylight out of the protein. You know, just do brute force stuff, walk around the outside of the, of the protein shell in the membrane and see whether we got any hits. Uh, but then, of course, I've, for years, I've been talking to colleagues in the physiology department uh, at, at Cornell, and these are uh, simulation people. They're molecular dynamic simulation people. And, and there's now much more access for MD simulation just because of the computational power and the, and the way the analyses are done. So it was what could not have been done perhaps 10 years ago uh, became extremely easy to do now, easy for them to do and for me to watch. So what they did was, <laughs> what they did was park an opsin monomer in a slab of membrane. And the monomer now is important because it's a simpler computational system when you have one protein instead of the dimer. And they did all these things for those interested. And uh, the interesting part also is that in total, they were able to drum up 50 microseconds of time on this computation, which is not literally not something you would think of uh, not that very long ago. But now it's uh, possible. The computers have names. They're called Anton, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. But that's where the computations are done. But the result was absolutely striking. So. But the guy who was doing this, George Kailashvili, was sitting there bored. You couldn't talk to him. He's saying, well, nothing's happening. And he'd go off and drink coffee. And this went on for months. And then after a while, it got to, the, got to a point where you couldn't get him on the phone. You couldn't talk to him at all because he'd seen something like this. So this is an aggregate picture from the full 50 microseconds of simulation uh, showing water molecules going between transmembrane helix 6 and 7. Of, uh, of opsin. So here's a whole chain of blue water, uh, water molecules populating this entire path. If you switch out the water and look at where phospholipids are, you find that phospholipid phosphates, which is basically the linkage between the head group and the glycerol, have populated the same pathway all the way uh, to the top. So there's a large entryway on the cytoplasmic side, and this whole caviar-like arrangement shows you where phospholipids have once been along this pathway. So this is, again, between helix 6 and 7. And so the way this pathway developed, and I'll walk you through this very quickly, is that if you look at the bottom end, the cytoplasmic end of helix 7, there's, a, there's an ionic uh, linkage here between two residues. And there's a tyrosine here that flaps around stochastically. Some of the time it talks to helix 6. Some of the time it looks inward, pointing to helix 2. The details are not important. It's just sort of flapping back and forth. And when, when it flaps in and this thing breaks, uh, then there's an opening. There's a widening of this gap here, and water starts coming in. So you have to have the tyrosine disappear inward and this linkage to break. And that happens with sufficient frequency that you have a chance to have water coming in. And once the water comes in, then lipids follow. And so there are three lipids here. It's a little confusing, the color combination. So there are lipids in red, green, and blue. So the red one is the one that has advanced the most after this 
after this opening has, uh, has been created and the red's gone up here through some part of the simulation. And as it comes up here about midpoint where this, where these, where this structure has a waste, the waste expands just a little bit so the constriction is dilated. And, uh, and then the lipid goes up further. And when it goes up further, a couple of other lipids follow. And eventually the red lipid manages to get past the waistline and the other two fall back in this particular arrangement. And so if you take a snapshot, and it's an extremely suggestive snapshot at one point of this pathway, and it's a side view now to show you the helix seven in orange and uh, six in orange and seven in red. You have three lipids with their heads tucked in, very similar to the cartoon that I showed you earlier, where you short circuit the bilayer. And this is a case where all three lipids were at this point, the red one went further and the other two fell back. But it looks exactly like this picture that was I think drawn in 2008 and appeared in a review article in 2009 that Adam drew and that uh, Ivan, I think, called the credit card model for obvious reasons, or at least he said that and that's how the, uh, the drawing appeared. But it looks extremely similar to that. So this is, uh, this is now a possible uh, way in which, this, uh, in which lipid scrambling would occur according to the simulations. Okay, so that was published sometime uh, last year. And there's a point that I want to make before I sort of wind down. Uh, which is, uh, this has, again, nothing to do with the lipid sig with the um, signaling activity of rhodopsin or of other G-protein coupled receptors. So this is, again, a view from the cytoplasmic side. There's a fair amount about, uh, concerning what, uh, about what's known in terms of helix movements when you signal, when you add a ligand, so in, the, in this case, a switch of the 11 cis to all transretinal. In the case of the adrenergic receptor, you'd add a ligand. So there are particular movements of, the, of these helices. The most dramatic one is helix 6 coming out like this. So the easiest way to look at it, and this is the, you can conceptualize all GPCR's papers now to 80% precision by imagining that you have a helical bundle like this, ligand binds to the top, and helix 6 moves out. That's all that's happening for most of them. And then the details are, of course, interesting, important, and so on. But that's what's happening, and the G protein binds. That movement is what is depicted here and is not related at all to the movements that the simulation produced in terms of what's happening for, uh, for, um, uh, for scrambling. So helix 6 uh, moves out in a different way. It parts company from 7, so there's a big 10 angstromish uh, movement at the cytoplasmic end of those, two, of those two helices, and various other movements occur, but they're not related to the signaling movements uh, that would bind uh, G protein. So this constitutes some form of constitutive uh, twitching of the protein, uh, uh, and this is something that is turned on by agonist or other, or other binding. of So Adam um, should possibly be giving this talk himself, uh, uh, turned the uh, cartoon into something more detailed. So this is based on the simulation. So you've actually got the PDB structure of the, of the protein in one of the states that was captured uh, during the simulation, and then you have, uh, have it parked in a realistic lipid bilayer with lipids that are moving between helix 6. This is the one uh, here, and 7 that is, uh, that is over here. I think the blur is his. The rest is from the simulation. Okay, so let me summarize a part of this story. So, um, so the first point is monomeric opsin, and that's true of these other GPCRs as well. Scrambles lipids at a rate greater than 10 to the 5 per protein per second after reconstitution into LUVs. So these are simple LUVs. It doesn't matter if they're compositionally it's slightly more complex, but we haven't solved the problem of whether cholesterol inhibits this activity or not, because when you reconstitute with cholesterol, you get a whole, you get a heterogeneous vesicle population, which you cannot deal with if you have an endpoint assay. So we are solving that problem in different ways, single vesicle imaging, all kinds of things. But at the moment, this is basically a PC or a PCPE vesicle, and the uh, scrambling rate is, is huge. And that explains the uh, result. It puts a molecule into the observation of Wayne Hubble in 1993 and, and Hoffman a bit later about, how, about why disks or how disks are scrambling phospholipids uh, in the assays that they reported. So the MD simulation provide indication of a hydrophilic path that's dynamically exposed between transmembrane helix 6 and 7. 6 is also interesting for the signaling pathway, but its movements here are distinct from, uh, from those that are needed for G-protein binding. And the pathway looks exactly like this credit card model. I don't want to say that, actually. There's a little story which, I, which is about Conrad Bloch, since we're in a lipocentric, lipocentric um, uh, topic here. So Conrad Bloch as a PhD student rushed up to his advisor saying, I've done the experiment, it's exactly what I thought. 
And the advisor said, how boring. So, you know, we don't want to be quite in this situation here of saying that we have a result that looks like something that was predicted. Okay, and then this one comment here about the opsin-mediated lipid scrambling uh, may be required for maintaining the, the, uh, uh, the, the bilayer, the disk bilayer, make, keeping the number density fixed in the presence of these other ATP-driven transporters. So coming back to the cell that I started with, so the yeast cell, uh, we have the possibility that there are proteins like this now, opsin-like proteins is, uh, of this, this type, that sit in the endoplasmic reticulum and arrange for bilayer uh, exchange of uh, lipids between the two leaflets of the bilayer. And then you would have a similar protein uh, sitting at the plasma membrane, except that it would have to be turned on by some trigger, either calcium or caspase cleavage. The TMEM16 protein, 16F, that's involved in, the, in exposing PS in platelets, has in its, the crystal structure that was published maybe five years ago, and there are several more structures of that since. That looks very much as if it's got a groove. It's a dimer, and each of the monomers has, uh, facing away from the dimer interface, literally has a cutout. It looks like a tea cozy handle, you know, the kind of thing that you would grab onto, and the inside of that is hydrophilic. It looks exactly like the original cartoon that I showed you. So in that case, the, the groove exists. The, it's opened up because a helix moves out, allowing a continuous passage. In the case of a rhodopsin-like molecule, it seems to be dynamically exposed because of these fluctuations in the, in the membrane. Okay. And, but there are many, uh, there are questions left. So we have, uh, we have molecules, at least some of them, but we, and, uh, and uh, sort of clues to mechanism. But then there have to be tests of the mechanism. So there are those who would say the MD is fine where it is on a computer, but one has to actually uh, verify it in some way. And there are obvious ways to verify it. There are cysteine residues. One can try and uh, staple the helices together, modify its polarity, all kinds of things. Those tests have already been done quite deeply for the TMEM16 family of proteins, and, it's, and the groove pathway is uh, you mess with it and you upset the uh, scrambling activity. So this general concept of having a trans bilayer hydrophilic groove and allowing lipids to sort of swipe their way through at least is uh, verified for the TM TMEM16 family. Regulation. So why are these proteins silent in the plasma membrane? And it's, uh, you know, one is you can ask that question specifically about the mechanism, but it's also it's also interesting to know what role the membrane plays in, in, uh, in dictating the activities of, of membrane proteins. Is, are, is the bilayer thinner there? Is it more rigid? Uh, do lipids not access the bilayer? There's some speculation that even though the lipid may move from one side to the other, the release time uh, can vary. So, it, uh, so they're not released from the transporter as quickly as they're transported across. So there's a pileup. So there are all kinds of uh, questions to be dealt with there. And then there's this perpetual problem of identifying the ER glycolipid scramblazes. And I, if anyone wants to have their ear bent about what we are doing about this, I can tell them. OK, so I want to end with an acknowledgment slide. There are several people here. That's my wife up there who did the opsin work. And actually, she did the opsin work. I'm looking at you, Judith, because you said, I think you sent a biochemistry student to my lab. Who, and we put him on this project, and it didn't suit him at all. And she looked at him sort of you know, not doing so well. He then went off, I think, to Rick Amasino to do more pleasant things than, you know, grinding cow eyes and things like that. And so she said she can do all of this, and that's, that's so she's the first author on the Opsin Discovery uh, paper. Mike Gorin is the, is the um, uh, student here from, uh, who, who um, got his PhD with, uh, with Brian Fox, and he's the one who did the constitutive activation of, uh, the constitutive activity of these proteins. Um, Big Employer is the one who discovered the retinitis pigmentosa mutations that, uh, that make um, monomers of, of opsin on their way to reconstitution. Uh, George Kalashvili is the molecular dynamics uh, simulation person. Jeremy Dittman is a faculty colleague who does math when he's, uh, when he's depressed, when he has nothing else to do, when he's in seminars and he's bored, so that's what he does. He has endless pages of scribbles, so he's the one who helped to model that Poisson distribution properly, allowing for vesicle size distribution amongst other things. So it was two pages of fiddling during a seminar and that's what was used in the paper. So I have various other collaborators. Uh, Oliver Ernst is the, is the uh, structural biologist uh, doing opsin work. Uh, Josh uh, Levitz is uh, doing single particle analyses and he's my neighbor now. And Vadim Marshavsky is, the, is mm -hmm. I didn't talk much about his work, but he's the one who follows up uh, with these RP retinitis pigmentosa mutations in, uh, in mice, looking to see whether the whether that, the dimerization deficiency, is what would uh, provide an explanation for these funny mutations that uh, no one has 
sort of understood the, the molecular basis for. Okay, so I will end with a movie from George, and I'm happy to take questions, and thank you very much for coming. So that, uh, that's the OPSIN simulation here. So. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Uh, we can't do anything about. I mean, unless you know. Well, so unless you pinpoint some, uh, you have to make a mutant. Perhaps that's an obvious way to do it. Um, there is a membrane. There is a membrane issue. So I've alluded to the fact that the plasma membrane is, has got more saturated lipids, higher cholesterol, and so on. So rhodopsin, which is in the disc membranes, which is where it signals from. Uh, that's where it also scrambles, and that's the original Hubble experiment. But there's rhodopsin in the plasma membrane, and there it doesn't signal. And that plasma membrane is a high cholesterol membrane. So uh, there is a possibility that they are, the two are coupled, that the membrane controls what the protein is doing, because it's not clear, because other GPCRs, for example, would signal at the plasma membrane in endocytic compartments where you have high cholesterol, saturated lipids, and so on. Um, Right, but it's not so easily answered unless you have some control over the scramblaze pathway, so to do the experiment in reverse. So you were, hello, oh, uh, yeah, you, were, you were surprised at the uh, axillary function for the uh, rhodopsin, the opsin molecule. So how many scramblazes are, go are there going to be for your average mammalian cell? Have you catalogued them? So, um, well, how many different activities are there? So there are, I, those I counted out for you, which is there are at least three for, for, the, um, for the glycosylation pathways. There should be at least one for phospholipid scrambling in ER, possibly one for moving sphingolipids in the Golgi because the glycosphingolipids are made on one side of the, of the, of the early Golgi, so glucosylceramide is made on one side as we move to the other side and so on. So these are, these are these are activities. So how many molecules are going to do this, right? So GPCRs, there are 800 odd of them, 900 of them in the mammalian human genome. Uh, in principle, they're all doing this, or at least all the class A GPCRs are doing this. Uh, they're not doing it in a real sense because they may be, I mean, they're in the plasma membrane and they're perhaps silenced by the membrane. But they could contribute uh, to the phospholipid scrambling requirement of the endoplasmic reticulum when they are first integrated into that membrane before they are trafficked out of that membrane. So it could be a general fold. All of them have the same characteristic uh, seven transmembrane helix, same arrangement of residues and so on, quite a reasonable amount of conservation. So the question is whether there is a different class of proteins altogether that would do this. I don't, uh, yeah. There may be others. I mean, there are plenty that don't. Um, I'll give you an example, one way to test for this, which is you take endoplasmic reticulum, so we just narrow it down to that, that organelle, and uh, dissolve it in detergent and fractionate it by some mechanism. We, you, we've been using velocity gradients forever because it's a convenient way to fractionate. You get a peak of activity, which means that lots and lots of proteins on that gradient have nothing to do with scrambling. So if there's a large family of them, they're coincidentally co-fractionating around 4S on that gradient. So that's, prob that's, that's not a good enough answer, but it's an approximation to how many different, there are lots of things that fractionate there, but it's, but it's not really conceivable that all of them would belong to one protein family. Okay. There'll be more, there'll be many more than we think at the moment, just because of the way the, just because of the way the activity, the requirements for the activity. Yeah. Thank you. So you mentioned you were investigating whether cholesterol might block this uh, flipase, or sc sorry, scramblase activity. Yeah. Any clues from the modeling as to how a lipid with a particular head group or a particular saturation pattern might lock this uh, scramblase activity at a particular step? So, so one is these are all, all the lipids that have been used are these fluorescent lipids of different stripes, so different head groups, so choline, ethnolamine, serine, inositol, so on. Uh, acyl chain labeled fluorophores. We've also used fluorescent groups on the heads of the lipids, so you can modify aminophospholipids with fluorophores on their head. All of those things are indistinguishably fast. 
Uh, acyl chains don't seem to matter to the extent that our ability to resolve, you know, kinetics are not optimal, so we only have an you know, endpoint data. So what we did recently that was also published last year was to try to see whether there was a limit and that uh, to the size of the head group. So we made a whole series of pegylated lipids, so different, so a nested set of, of pegs, 500, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000. Uh, and this was in the context of the TMEM16 proteins where there's a defined groove of about a nanometer or so in size. So it would be, you know, the expectation was that big heads wouldn't go through. They all did. So the question is how much the groove is physically transferring lipids in this, um, in, the, in this fashion, or whether it's doing some of this, but also doing something to perturb the membrane in its immediate vicinity, so the shell of lipids around, the, around this groove. Uh, that is somehow defective and also allowing things to pass. So the problem with the PEG experiments is even though they are sort of spectacular and unnerving because large things are going through, uh, PEGs can unravel. So we're not precisely sure whether they stay as globular entities or they're becoming extended in any way before passing through. So those experiments are being redone with dendrimers now with defined structures. So uh, we'll see whether that happens. So head groups don't seem to matter for the moment. The acyl chains don't matter. The fluorophore can be anywhere, very promiscuous. What this protein will not do is transfer one of the dolichol intermediates. So the man 5 glucnac 2 diphosphate dolichol needed for end glycosylation is not uh, scrambled by this. And there the chain might matter, or it could be the diphosphate linkage, which is not found in any uh, phospholipid. So, yeah. any, any more questions for Anat? Thank you, that was beautiful. So I understood that retinol is not required for the no. transport, but is it inhibitory? Does it actually change the endpoint? Or slow? I guess the kinetics is hard, but do you get a yeah, less so Mike, efficient transfer? Uh, Mike go so the question was whether retinol blocks transport. So the, 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 pay, the work that Mike Goran did and that we published a few years ago, we went out of our way to check this, but I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that we had, it, uh, we had it right. So the thing to do is to make rhodopsin so dark adapted rhodopsin with 11 cis retinal in it, you sit in the dark room and you, when you express the protein, you add the retinal to cultured cells, all in the dark, all dim red light. I can't do this, I can't see anything, but he, Mike was able to do stuff. Uh, reconstitute in the dark with the fluorescent lipid, add dithionite in the dark, give it 10 minutes, desalt the preparation to get rid of the dithionite and then take it out to do the endpoint measurement in the fluorimeter. So he did all of that and there was still activity. The only problem was that he needed a rather large amount of rhodopsin to reconstitute for that activity. And it looked as if it was a 6-mer or an 8-mer, which is what we reported. What it could have been is that most of it was not doing anything and that Mike, in a moment of weakness, turned the light on or did some, did some so, a small frac, so a small fraction was converted to an opsin. And so what we were measuring was we had to load in a lot of protein in order to capture the small fraction. So we are revisiting it. I doubt that this was the case. I mean, he's not doing, he's not turning on the light and that. But anyway, but I, I, that's a possibility because it's unusual to have such a big oligomer uh, going into the vesicle. So I think that's, that's possible. So in, in that case, the retinal would be blocking the path. And it's close to that path. So it's sitting there close to it like this. And so one would imagine that you'd block the path. Yeah, so we are doing that again, but, um, yeah. Good. Okay, I think Anat will be here for a few more minutes, see if you have more questions. Uh, so, oh, you. Yeah. 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 Um, So we have, uh, there's a whole family of opsins. I mean, apart from the, uh, the mammalian type GPCRs, there's a whole family of opsin, opsins. There are bacterial ones, there are archaeal ones. Some don't have retinal, some don't even have the lysine on which the retinal would be, would be attached. So we did this same type of experiment with bacterial rhodopsin from the purple membrane. So you grow the cells. You, you, uh, there are complications there because you can strip the protein in different ways to get rid of the shell of annular lipid that comes with it. Um, but under conditions where bacterial rhodopsin was able to pump protons in a light-dependent way, it was scrambling lipids in a light-independent way. So, 
same kind of thing. You, uh, and it was doing it as a trimer. So again, using these same reconstitution plots that I showed you, the fits there gave, uh, yielded precisely a trimeric molecular weight, which is what, which is what bacteriorhodopsin's core structure is. It makes itself into a trimer before in the purple membrane it expands into this big lattice. So. This. This one. No, the the last the video. Oh, I see. Yeah, so, so a couple of comments. So first of all, bacteriodopsin doesn't lose the retinal, right? It's a two-photon cycle. It regenerates on the spot. Secondly, it looks like uh, mammalian rhodopsin, but it isn't. It's got seven transmembrane spans, but the arrangements are different. The rigidity of the bundle is quite different. So in fact, the hope was yeah, everything. So the hope was that it wouldn't do it, and then one would start before this MD simulation was done. The idea was to try some chimera type thing to see if you could convert a bacteriorhodopsin into a mammalian opsin, except that it was doing this. We again did some simulation work with bacteriorhodopsin, and there the pathway seems to, there seems to be a polarity generated initially by the interface between two of the uh, protomers before it goes along. So it would not look exactly like this, but we haven't followed that up. I, yeah. I have okay. When you Yeah. You should do. Um, so if you take an ABC, so it depends where you do the measurement. If you do this in a synthetic vesicle, you get almost no transfer. You get very small amplitudes, and that's because you're principally moving lipids from one leaflet to the other, and you get strain immediately by populating one leaflet at the expense of the other. In a mammalian cell, in a live cell, where you do such measurements, there's compensation immediately because of lipid exchange of the type that I mentioned at the outset. There's rapid exchange uh, between, uh, between the biosynthetic compartment, the plasma membrane. There's a lot of vesicular exchange and so on. So that gradient, uh, pol the potential is lost more or less immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you.